Hello everyone and welcome to the third edition of the Healthcare NLP Summit. My name is David Talby, CTO at John Snow Labs, and I'm very excited to see how many of you are tuned in. It's amazing to see just how fast this community has grown in the past years, and I look forward to two amazing days with an event full of content, sharing, and networking. Our program features 10 keynotes and 23 technical sessions on NLP best practices, real-world case studies, and the challenges of applying state-of-the-art NLP in healthcare and life science. You will be able to learn and network with NLP leaders from companies such as Google, Microsoft, Stanford, CRFM, Intel, Pfizer, Databricks, CVS Health, Genentech, Merck, and many more. Before we officially kick off with the first keynote presentation, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items to make sure you are more familiar with the conference platform and the amazing features you can enjoy during this event. Please note that there are three virtual stages at the event. After the keynote talks, three sessions will run simultaneously. So check out the schedule on the menu bar in the reception section to decide which one you'd like to attend. All sessions will be available on demand for two weeks after the event. So uh, no, worry, no worries about catching all of them today. They will be published here on the platform in the replay section right after the event. Each stage has a Q&A panel where you can ask questions throughout each of the sessions. Use this opportunity to drop your comments or any questions for the speakers or any other community members right in the chat. Get the chance to meet like-minded like -minded NLP practitioners using the networking feature of the platform. Uh, you can send other attendees a message or uh, meet them randomly for short, fun video sessions. If you'd like to connect with John Snow Labs, uh, visit our booth and we'll be happy to get in touch and answer any questions. We look forward to two days filled with excellent NLP content the main themes of this year's summit are large language models and responsible AI. The summit covers uh, all the recent news in healthcare-specific large language models, their current benchmarks, their challenges, and their current applications. The second theme and the topic of the first keynote is how you can apply responsible NLP today with open source tools, because this is fast becoming a critical public concern and also a real bottleneck in applying new models in real-world projects. This session introduces you to a new open source library that you can use today uh, to test your NLP models across the full spectrum of what a model, a responsible, ethical, safe and effective NLP model should be tested for before you take it to production. Responsible AI it has been a topic of a lot of discussion. Um, and one thing that we all need to understand as practitioners is that it, without having to wait for regulation or legislation, it is already not optional. And in quite a few areas, and especially healthcare and life science, you may, you may already be doing things illegally if you're not making sure that uh, the models that you actually send to production systems are uh, safe, robust, reliable, fair, uh, unbiased, uh, and in general, just you know, meet, meet the law and the regulation as they already are. And as you can see, this is an issue with consumer protection, it's an issue with explainability, it's an issue with recruiting or HR tools, and it is definitely, definitely an issue when you're talking about clinical decision support tools, uh, anything that is patient uh, facing or, or anything that is clini uh, clinician say, uh, facing. So uh, we at John Snow Labs are, are already signed under several legal agreements and requirements that the models you deliver are actually ethical, fair, unbiased, and responsible. And the open source library I'd like to, to share with you today embodies a lot of the best practices and experience we've learned over the past few years about how, how to make this happen. So when companies in general have to respond to the kind of public backlash or regulatory question about responsible AI, they, they start with frameworks. And, and a framework is a, usually a nice visual that looks something like this, where a company says, oh, look, we, we will be responsible and our models will be ethical and will be societal and will be human-centered and all of those good things. And they put those nice pictures. 
and then other companies put more nice pictures that essentially say say the same thing that they have this holistic view about what how all of this should be and what the the principles and the goal should be and we we reach the point where every large company every large consulting company uh, have this kind of kind of very well thought out a uh, holistic story about how those things should happen uh, the challenge is is that we all agree on the principles and the goals but uh, where we especially us as, as data scientists as software engineers have issues okay here's what we want to do but what what do you want me to do day to day how do we actually make this happen and what we do know that there is a big big gap between the the principles and the goal and the actual day-to-day implementation and uh, here are some recent papers uh, but uh, the, the the bottom line is is pretty simple the current models that we use whether you know specific tuned deep learning models or large language models have a severe and widespread issues uh, when you deal with even things that are you know, really as simple as, as classic robustness. Uh, so the, the checklist paper looked at sentiment analysis models and tested the, the large free, uh, cloud providers and their public APIs. And, and it, so, you know, it measured that, for example, if you just replace neutral words, okay, like you know, I'm flying from or, or I'm flying to, and you replace those, uh, you know, replace those, you, you can get you know, 10 to 16% of errors, just like replacing a neutral, neutral word neutral word. Uh, you can get up to 20% of errors just by replacing where you fly to. So instead of flying to Dallas, you fly to New York, sentiment changes 20% of the time. Uh, if you look at negation or temporal an- analysis, for example, I used to think this airline is horrible, but now I think it's good. Uh, the models fail almost all the time in terms of what you'd expect, right? For something to you know, that should be positive or, or neutral and comes out negative or the other way around. Uh, there are other papers that look specifically at um, biases. Uh, so what happens when the, the names that you use to call people are uh, you know, predominantly white names, black names, Asian names, uh, Hispanic names, and so on. Uh, what happens when we just add ethnicity? Uh, so one uh, well-known paper from last year in healthcare uh, looked at the impact of slight changes in text on a patient risk prediction model and showed that any mention of ethnicity, so saying this is a 66-year-old, Female, you say this is 60 year, a 66 year old, white female, black female, Hispanic, Japanese, African, whatever may be the case, any mention reduces the accuracy um, of the models and basically assume the patient has less risk. And of course, there were big biases across different ethnic groups. There are also, there are also issues with toxicity. There are issues with data leakage of sensitive information from training data into models. And of course, they're just core accuracy. Uh, so if you look at responsible AI best practices and what you need to implement, there, there are three basic things that you need to pay attention to. The first super important thing is that you need to actually test your models. And if there's anything we have learned from 50 years of software engineering, uh, is that, look, you need to test your software. Uh, if you did not test your software, you should not be surprised at all that it has serious bugs. A lot of the papers, like the papers on the last slide or other papers that look at, at issues uh, with current NLP models, uh, they, they, they state this uh, very explicitly. They said, look, uh, the reason we're finding all those issues is honestly because we're the first ones to ever look. And uh, when we began to solve these issues a few years ago in our, mo- our own models, uh, you look at it in, in one example and you say, okay, this is a bug. We should be able to have a test for it, where we can run automated regression tests, and we should test for all these other things, and we should do this really on a daily basis as part of our build. Uh, so really, this is the first and most important thing that we want to get done and we want to enable you to do. Just actually test your models before you put them in production. The second important important principle and best practice is that uh, really you should not take a model that was published as part of an academic paper, right? As a you know, as a checkpoint or something, put something on GitHub or on a model hub, and just use that in a production system. Um, there is a very big gap between a published research and reproducible research, and between really reliable, you know, even ethical, responsible software systems. And really, that's one area where there's really not that much of a difference between software engineering and kind of model engineering or, or data science. Um, once you have something that's been published academically, even when we find that it does reproduce, it does generalize, 
there's a lot of work you need to put into it because it's something that would actually be reliable in a production system. Uh, the third principle that's also stressed, uh, uh, that's basically in consensus by, by really everyone in the industry, uh, from you know, researchers, practitioners, uh, is, the, is the concept of testing beyond accuracy. Uh, so of course, when you have a model, if you have a, you know, a translation model, question answering model, emotion uh, analysis model, the first thing you care about is how accurate the model is. Uh, but uh, really your goal should be uh, to test holistically. Right? So you also want to look at bias, you also want to look at robustness, you also want to look at toxicity, efficiency, safety, and make sure that your model passes the bar uh, in all of those different dimensions. So uh, to enable you uh, to actually get this done in real-world NLP models, I am uh, thrilled to introduce uh, the NLP test library, which is a new open source library that we are actually announcing today uh, publicly. It is a fully open source library under the Apache 2.0 license, and this is intended to uh, be able to uh, give it to you uh, so that you can use it, including in, uh, commercially uh, for any, any purpose and uh, without having to, you know, to share or, uh, um, or uncover anything that you already do. So there are really no strings attached. The goal is to make it a very simple library. So the goal is to make it simple for people to generate tests, to run tests, to have regression tests, to integrate with their MLOps frameworks. There are more than 50 test types that are already available to you today out of the box. And we do intend to add more as time goes by. And the goal is to make it comprehensive, right? So the goal is to come and say, look, this should be the one library where really if, if you pass this one, if you pass the test you generated, right? And of course you can add your own, your own and customize it. You should feel safe to go to production and you should feel confident to talk to your uh, customers, to talk to regulators, right? And show them, right? With, with human readable tests, with documentation, with a kind of with a science-backed foundation of how the tests were generated, uh, that these models uh, actually are safe and effective to be used in the real world. Uh, the NLP test library uh, is focused on automating three steps or three tasks in your data science workflow. So if you look at this diagram, instead of doing really what many people do today, which is they train a model, and once it passes a certain F1 score, it's kind of they think it's, it looks good enough or stable enough, they basically release it, right? So they, they put it in some versioning system, and then it, it goes, to, goes to production. Uh, we, we want to add three, three steps. Uh, first of all, we generate tests. Uh, one uh, cool thing that we can do today, thanks to generative AI, is that unlike you know, JUnit or PyTest or the you know, the, the, the unit test uh, uh, frameworks for, for classic software, uh, we can actually, actually automatically generate a lot of the tests, right? So if you want to change entities, replace names with names from other ethnicities, change pronouns to female pronouns, uh, you know, add typos or gram grammatical mistakes, we can do that automatically. So we want to be able to generate tests. So that's one thing. The second thing is, of course, run the tests and be able to configure, uh, you know, using different, different libraries, different techniques, uh, decide when do we uh, think this model is good enough to pass and go to production and when it isn't. The third thing we want to do, if it isn't, we want to be able to uh, do some data augmentation. So we can generate some data that you can add to your training set so that uh, then you can retrain the model and basically try again uh, and see if you can uh, improve things. So that is the scope of the NLP test library. Uh, and then this should be something you can run, of course, like on your laptop, right? As just something interactive you do. Uh, or also something that should integrate easily with really whatever AI ops or CI CD solution uh, that you're already using. In terms of uh, simplicity, uh, here's how you start using NLP tests and get some results in three lines of code. Uh, so this is a Python library, it's open source, so you just pip install NLP test. Then uh, from NLP test, you import harness, uh, the harness class encapsulate uh, test harness. And then you create a harness and you create a harness. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do it, but basically you give it a model, you give it a task, you give it a data set, and you say uh, which hub this is coming from. Uh, so here we create a harness for the uh, birth based name entity recognition model from the Hugging Face Models Hub. Uh, and then uh, we have one line that's a.generate.run.report. So here's what this does the call to generate uh, actually automatically generates generate a set of test cases, uh, basically starting from the task, from the model, and from the test data set that you gave it. 
uh, with the default configuration. Uh, and then uh, what you have, you have a test suite. You have a set of test cases uh, that, uh, uh, that you can either save or uh, you can run them. Uh, when you run, it actually does inference. So it runs those test cases uh, against uh, the model that you've given it. Uh, and it creates a new data frame with the test results showing for each test case whether it passed or failed, what the result was. And then uh, you can call a report which summarizes the different test cases and basically helps you uh, decide uh, whether you passed or failed and which categories passed or failed. So that's the high level and we'll go into detail about each one of those uh, steps very soon. But uh, really uh, you're just welcome to try it. There are uh, examples on the website and with three lines of code uh, you can actually get a result and see where your model stands, at least with no configuration whatsoever. One important concept with NLP test is that it is multi-library. Uh, so our goal was to make sure we can write the library once and write uh, all the test types once, and for you as a, as a user of this, write test once and then run them everywhere. Uh, right now, out of the box, we support uh, three types of tests. We support the uh, Johnson Labs uh, NLP, we support uh, Hugging Face and Transformers, and we support Spacey. Uh, so if you're doing any text classification or name entity recognition, uh, you can start with any of those hubs. Uh, in the future, we plan to add more uh, libraries as well as more cloud APIs. Uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work in the just design of the library uh, so that the libraries are really decoupled from the test types. Uh, so for example, if you're adding a new test types, so for example, you, you know, you're contributing, you're coding a new toxicity test, uh, the test will work across all the supported libraries and APIs. And if you're adding support for a new library, so for example, uh, you know, when, when we had support for a uh, Flare or we had support for GPT-4 or we had support for testing AWS Comprehend, then uh, once you've added it, kind of that, uh, once you've implemented that uh, interface once, all the test types uh, will be able to run uh, against that new library of, or API. So uh, the goal is really from the get-go, uh, really make sure this right once test everywhere uh, concept works. Uh, now, in terms of what you actually want to do, the first thing that uh, you usually want to do when you have a new, uh, a new model and a new uh, test data sets is to auto-generate tests. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there are more than 50 types of tests that uh, the library can already generate uh, from uh, many, many different types. Okay? So for example, there are different types of robustness tests. We can uh, insert typos, uh, replace letters, remove punctuation, change all the text to uppercase. Uh, change dates, those types of things. There are fairness tests. Uh, so you, you can come and say, uh, of course, there are accuracy tests. So you can come and say, look, the F1 score of the entire model or per entity needs to be at least you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.7, whatever, need, whatever you, you really want it to be. But you can also say, uh, look, uh, specifically for females, uh, accuracy has to be at least, for example, 0 0.8. And specifically for males, it has to be 0 0.9. And specifically for the unknown gender, right, or the other gender, it needs to be something else. Uh, so that if your model, for example, performs very unequally across genders, uh, or it could be you know, age groups or other dimensions, those tests would actually fail. Um, there are different types of bias and coverage uh, tests. So we can replace different types of entities. Uh, we can replace sports. We can replace nationalities. Uh, we can replace ethnicities. We can also replace personal names. Right, so so uh, you can look at a name and replace it with a name that you know that is Muslim, that is Hindu, right, that is uh, uh, predominantly black, right, uh, Hispanic, and so forth, and really seeing how well your model does and categorize that. Uh, you can uh, look at bias around age, right? So add adjectives like you know the young person, the old person, and see if that, that changes the behavior of the model. You can look at origins. Uh, you can also look at representation. Uh, so for example, sometimes the the reason that the model does very poorly on, for example, females, uh, is because just really most of the test data set, right, most of the training data set is just males, right? And sometimes you, you don't have, even have enough examples to calculate an F1 score. So there are also represent, representation tests. Uh, so overall, uh, as you can see, our goal was uh, to cover the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, we are not done yet. Uh, of course, there, there's more that we want to add around, around leakage, around toxicity, uh, around uh, different types of stereotypes. Uh, there's also a coverage that we want to add across languages and nationalities. Uh, but I think what you'll find is that already out of the box, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly comprehensive set already. Uh, and as mentioned, it works uh, uh, across uh, libraries, right? And enables you to get started automatically. After you've generated tests, 
uh, you would want to run them. So the tests you've generated, uh, and you can generate them by calling generate manually or, or by calling load if you're doing a regression test, uh, they, they basically look something like this. You have a test type and you can come and say, look, here, here's the test case. So in the first example, for example, we just added a typo, we changed doctor to doctor. And we said, look, if you're doing name entity recognition, I still expect you to recognize you wrongly as a person, right? Uh, if you have other types of tests, then the test type may mean something different size. So like mean gender F1 score for female has to be at least 0.85. And you have this list. Our goal is to make this list human readable and you can export it, you can edit it, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, once you run the tests, you run all of the test cases and definitely it could be hundreds or thousands right for one model. Uh, and then uh, once you call run and call report, you get a summary that uh, gives you a per category of tests. And for each category, you have pass rate. So how many of the tests from that category actually pass? And then you can configure what's the minimum pass rate for each category, uh, which gives you kind of final score. Okay, did you pass? Uh, and in general, the test suite passes if you, uh, for each category, right? You, the number of tests that pass are at least uh, you know, at least at the minimum pass rate, right? Otherwise, kind of the suite fails. Uh, and then, for example, if you're in a CICD, right, that would return that kind of really the test fail and, and, and then your workflow will decide what happens next. Um, the, the last cool thing you can do is, is actually do something about it, right? If your tests are failing. Uh, and uh, this is where data augmentation comes in. So uh, I mean, if you think about it, if we can automatically generate test cases, for example, add typos, right? Or uh, change the names to have predominantly, you know, Hispanic names, right? Or Asian names, uh, then, and we found that you have an issue, what you'd want to do is, uh, one of the things you want to do is come, so can you just add those examples to my training data set, right? So that I can now retrain a model, and then I have more examples of the things I'm missing, and the model should perform better in that case. Uh, so that's the goal of the, the augment function. So on a harness, you have augment. Uh, one super important thing is that when you call augment, you don't use the test set. Uh, or of course, you don't use the test suite because that would be a classic example of data leakage, right? You cannot train a model on what you're testing it on. So what you provide augment is your training data set. Uh, and then uh, what we do is we generate other cases, not from the test set you give and not from the test suite, but directly from the training data set. Uh, but we do know what we need to generate. We know, right, from your last lesson where the gaps are, and we generate new examples. And then uh, this creates an augmented data set. The next thing you, you do is you, you just use this new augmented training data set to retrain your model, right? And then you can do with, you know, which any one of the supported uh, frameworks, libraries, or models, whatever you like, is kind of outside the library. And once you have a new model, you should run a regression test, right? You see, okay, how does your new model perform on the previous data set? Right? So what you do is you create a new harness, you load the new model, okay? But then instead of generating test set, you load. So you, you load a, a test suite, right? So test cases.csv, uh, because your goal is to do a regression test, right? You want to see how this new model performs against the same test you run before, and then you can run it and look at the results. Uh, so that's how data augmentation works. And uh, I would say, especially around robustness, and in some cases around uh, fairness, uh, Really, within a few minutes, you can substantially improve uh, how well your models are doing. Uh, the last thing you'd want to do is you, you want to be able to integrate testing in your, into your CI/CD or MLOps pipeline. And uh, this is just one example. Uh, our goal is to make sure that this is easy to integrate with any CI/CD or any MLOps pipeline that you have, because some people are just with Jenkins, some people are with you know, MLflow, some people are with SageMaker, right? And there are many, many other ones on the market. Uh, so uh, the goal really is just to make it easy with you know simple script or one liner or command line interface to be able to integrate it into whatever you already have, uh, and just really enable this workflow. Well, once you train a new model, basically before you put it in production, you just run a regression test, and you run it across all the dimensions and all the parameters that you know your model needs to be tested on, with the regression test suite that is human readable, so uh, you can see and you can share it with the domain expert, with the regulator even, uh, to show here's what. Here's how I actually measure, right? That I stand behind, behind my own responsible AI, AI principles in this case. And then uh, you get a result and whether, uh, based on whether you passed or failed, you can decide whether you deploy the model or you know, take some other corrective action. So uh, this is the library overall. As I say, it's very simple. It's open source with an Apache 2.0 license and it's available to you as of right now. We build it for you. Please use it. Please give us feedback. 
Uh, one thing I would say is uh, definitely expect very rapid releases. I mean, so far we release the software on a weekly basis and also long-term support from Johnson Labs. Um, so uh, with Johnson Labs, you know, we've been doing Spark NLP for, for about six years now. Uh, we have other open source libraries like NLP Display, uh, NLP Lab, and uh, NLU. Uh, so we do understand that when you release an open source project, it's not about what it does on day one. It's about knowing that uh, there's a full-time team behind it that will keep improving it, keep adding new libraries, keep adding new tasks, keep adding new languages, uh, help you with bugs, help you with support when you need it. Uh, and this is really our commitment. Our commitment it is to support this uh, with the real development team uh, for the long term so that this is really something that the community can depend on and you can depend on. Um, if you'd like to get started, the website is nlptest.org. So there, you know, there are examples of the full documentation, those tutorials. Uh, if you'd like to participate, uh, contributing, here's the, you know, here's the GitHub. It's a, you know, it's a public repo. Uh, you're very welcome. You know, open issues, com contribute uh, pull releases. If you'd like to talk to the team, there's the community chat. So we have a, a specialized channel uh, on our Slack. We will be happy to, you know, to help you, talk to you, get your feedback, and, and hopefully uh, help you uh, put this software to good use as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, and I wish you the best of luck with your responsible AI initiatives.